Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Carl, a member of the CK12 team, and my colleague Katie and I will be running today's webinar, Advanced Flexbook Editing. We're so glad you've joined us. We've had a great start to the 2018 Certified Educator Program this past week. By now, many of you are experts at navigating the CEP Google Class to find assignments and resources, and at using the Zoom features such as Q&A to ask the CK12 team questions and chat to network with other educators. To honor your time that you're putting in, especially given this is an advanced session, we're going to get straight to our core content. However, please don't hesitate to ask us um, any program, Zoom, or other questions in Q&A as we go. And with that, let me introduce you to Katie. Thanks, Carl, and thank you to everyone who joined us for today's session on advanced Flexbook editing. In our Getting Started with Flexbook sessions, we've covered the basics, including finding content on CK12, simple edits, and sharing your content with students and others. If you missed that session, I highly encourage you to watch the recording or join us this coming school year for a future offering of that session. In this webinar, along with a brief review of basic edits, we'll be covering the following topics. At first one, incorporating formatting and citing images. We'll go through our CC BY NC licensing, uploading, editing, and adding attributions, and figure versus inline images. We'll then move on to embedding videos and CK12 practice and other content. And from there, we'll move to using CK12 special character and math editor options, both with LaTeX coding and drop-down formatting. And finally, we'll talk about enhancing your Flexbook to add clarity by using formatting, links, added details, and talking about kind of the difference between accessing one online or offline um, if you were downloading a customized book. Our main goal is that by the end of the session, you understand all of the options you have as you customize and enhance content on CK12. But before we get into our core content of the webinar, it would be great if we found out a little bit more about your knowledge of our editing tools. Really soon, you'll see a poll here that will ask you about any customization you might have done with CK12. What experience do you have using and customizing CK12? Select all that apply. Um, and it looks like you're doing a lot of voting already, so I'll just be quiet and let you read through, and we'll tabulate those results. You guys are getting good at this. It's fast. We're already at 80%. All right, final clicks as we finish up this poll and then we'll share the results. All right, let's take a look here. And you can see here, um, I'm new to CK12's Flexbooks is 53% of you. So I love that you're taking an advanced editing course even though you're new to it, but still significantly 49% of you have made um, basic edits. Um, and then obviously a few people have done some editing, including imaging and um, embedding videos, et cetera. So that's what we're gonna spend more time on today so you all can become experts at doing that. So before we get into the content, just a reminder that core information for this session, like all our other sessions, can be found in the session resource page. That's posted in the matching topic in the CEP Google class, and we'll link that in the chat window as well. So with that, let's refresh a few points about basic customizing of Flexbooks. You'll see some of this again in this webinar as we work our way through, and we're happy to go through it with you if you have more questions, but we'll focus on the advanced components for this particular webinar. You can Click Customize to start this process, or from your library, choose Create New Modality. Delete and reorder content. Add and reorder, uh, add content via the menu within the editor or when browsing on CK12. Sharing content via URL, classes, integrated LMS, or the share plane. 
and you can now assign content directly to Google Classroom, just like you would for CK12 classes. Let's have Katie show you some of the components of adding new images to your Flexbooks. Thanks, Carl. Um, I'm going to talk about that, but just kind of with that idea of sharing, I know we had a question that was asking about finding a customized Flexbook in your app. Um, you would need to open that in a browser and then choose the open an app option right now. Um, we'll continue to work on options for accessing it directly within there. Um, but if you're looking to access stuff and share stuff and then access it offline in that app, just open it in a browser first and then you can open it in the app accordingly. So with that, let's talk about images. So there's two screens here that I wanna show you and then I'm gonna switch over and show you live these screens in action. But the first is the first image that pops up when you click add an image. It has your general information, including the ability to choose a file to include and preview that accordingly. And then the second one is the image options. And I'm putting this up here because I wanna make sure that you guys all take a second when you're adding images to go to that image options slide. Um, and that has type of options, positioning, width, a reminder about our license, um, and then source and credit information as we work our way through. So let me share my screen, and we can go through this piece, and you can start seeing this in action. So if I am teaching, let's say I'm teaching a life science class, I could go into a particular topic in life science and edit it, or I could pick one of my flexbook textbooks, and in this case I'm gonna go with life science concepts for middle school, and I can go in and I can customize this book. So the first time I customize this book, I'm gonna get the customize option. The next time, if I'm accessing my customized version, I'll see an edit choice here. But when, if I wanna start fresh and customize a new version, I'm gonna put for July 17th, just so we know which one we're working off of. Um, and then let's pick, today we're gonna to talk about animals. So let's pick a section in here that we can edit. So learn behavior of animals. So I clicked on that little pencil, We'll edit icon. It's gonna slowly load that page for a second the first time for July 17th. And I'm just tracking that so I know in my place, but if you wanna change the title, you're welcome to do so. If not, don't worry about it at all. And then you can see there's an image here. If I keep scrolling down, there's another image that's a figure. It has a little caption here, some multimedia. And then let's work on this image for a little bit. So let's talk about what this looks like. So a couple of things to note, right now I'm clicking on this, so I could just click on this insert edit image and it would pull up the information about this image. You can see here there's two pieces to this image. So the file was already chosen and uploaded into our system. And if I click on the image option piece, you'll notice that it's a figure image. The size is postcard and we'll go through all these in a second. There's an actual caption and then I put title and alt text. Now alt text is especially important for anything where a student is using um, text-to-speech and trying to figure out what that is. Um, don't worry about the ID, that's just kind of our internal tagging piece. But then the source and the credit are super important. So if I pull up this piece, and I copy that over, and I open this in a window, now notice there's two links in here, so I'm just gonna start with the first one. This first link is the original image on Flickr that we took and combined. You can see that Katie Hunt took this photograph and it even includes on Flickr some rights reserved. So it tells you what your licensing is. So in this some rights reserved piece, it says attribution. I can share, adapt, etc. I just have to give attribution to it and there are no additional restrictions. So that image is good to go. It fits under our license. I could take that or any other image with kind of those restrictions or public domain restrictions and include it. And then I can go back here and I could do the same thing for the other one. But this is nicely formatted, cleanly all set and figure. So I'm gonna cancel this for a second. You can see the caption underneath it. And right above it, I'm gonna upload the same image with some other options. So start from scratch, I'm gonna click on the image option. I'm gonna choose a file. In this case, we're gonna pull the same image for a second. And then I'm gonna flick over to the image option pieces. So here, I'm gonna to wanna to make sure that I credit this to Katie Hunt and Bill. I'm gonna pull this Flickr link from here and I'd wanna pull the other Flickr link as well. You can just pull that straight from share. I can pull that Flickr link, copy it, bring it back and paste it there. Um, and I would pull the other one as I was working my way through. 
But let's talk about some of the options for formatting. So right now our figure option gives me three choices for size. So if I make this a thumbnail image and then I insert it, you can see that it shows up as a much smaller image within this piece. If I go back and I edit this under figure and I choose full page, it's gonna make that image the full width of the page. And the full page is by width. So actually there's an image further down here, this one right here, that's super, super vertical. So if I click on insert edit image and I make that one full page, it actually becomes so huge that when I print it, it doesn't even fit on a full page because it made the width of the image the full page width. So just be aware that as you're working, you're talking about width of images, not height. So let's go back to the one I was working off of. And those are my three choices for figures. The other option is to put something in line. Now if I do that, I can't put a caption on it, so just know that piece. Um, but I can choose the pixel width, so maybe 600 pixels wide. Um, and then I could insert that piece as well. And so that's gonna be most of that screen as you work your way across. Um, the difference, the biggest difference that you wanna understand about figure and inline images is really only if you ever plan to print your customized book. So online, it's not gonna make a difference at all. Um, for an actual printed copy, if you were printing a downloaded customized version of your book, um, this figure at the bottom that has this caption that was marked as a figure would potentially bump slightly up in text or slightly down in text based on kind of trying to fill the printed page as much as possible with text. So you might see that figure up on the right instead of directly where it was in here. What that means for a teacher like me who taught math is that if you want the directions directly above, let's say this was a graph picture that I put in here and I want the directions to remain directly above it at all times, whether print or digital, then I would want to make sure that I'm choosing that inline, inline meaning in line with the text exactly where I put it and I could put it there. So just be aware of that piece as you're talking about images. Um, let's go back into this for one more second. I could add my alt text. We had someone asking about positioning for figure the other day. So basically your options are standard or left aligned. Um, and then the caption piece would only be for the figure. But inline gives me pixel width pieces and then that alt text that I can put in there. So CK12 kind of had that piece already there. I've been putting it in in the last few days of demoing. Um, and I would probably pull that other Flickr piece as well. Let's see if we could get both of those. I think I have the other one. I'd pull it from the previous image and pull that piece. But I'd wanna put all that information in there before I inserted it. If you have any questions about our licensing, it's remind you right here what our licensing is. So you can just click on that link. It will reopen the Creative Commons CC BY NC 3.0 licensing. And that says that you can share and adapt our content, but you must give credit and you cannot sell it. So that is the licensing that we work on for any content you're using on our site. Anything that you are adding to our site, whether that is images, text, videos, kind of that you're, well, you can't add videos into our site, they're on YouTube. Um, but images and text, as well as if you're uploading practice into our practice system, they have to fit under this licensing. So make sure that you're not doing anything that requires specific licensing, that requires more than simple attribution as you're working your way through. So keep that in mind. But once you have your images in there, you're all set. Um, I'm gonna remove this one because I didn't fully cite it and I wanna make sure it's not messed up in there. Um, and I'm probably gonna put this one back from the full page to let's say maybe a postcard option this time. And I'm gonna left align it just so you can see what this looks like. So there's my postcard. It's a little bigger than the thumbnail, but it's left aligned as opposed to centered. It's totally your option as you work your way through. Um, so I think that takes care of most of the pieces in terms of like, Formatting, uploading. I would say that um, when you do have this option, you could put a URL for an image. URLs tend to break on web pages. People update web pages, they do all sorts of things. So, if at all possible, I would recommend choosing the file and uploading an image cleanly um, and then making sure that you're citing all of that as you go through. Katie, we've got some questions here now that you're on. If you can go over the image options thing. Um, two questions. I'm not clear about the ID one of our users say. Do I leave that space empty? And then which one of the options allows the um, 
text to wrap around the figure? Sure, so the inline option would allow text to wrap around this figure. So let me cancel this for a second. Um, I'm gonna put text, let's say, right in here if I wanna put an image in here. Um, if at any point in time you don't have the option for this image or the media pieces up here, it could be that you're in like a header option. So let's say up at the very top, this is probably a header, that I can't edit media in there. So sometimes just be aware that if you're having trouble importing something, it might be because you're not in standard text. But let's say I wanted this image right in the middle here. I would choose that file. I would go over here. I would add all of the credit. I'd add the Flickr piece that was in there, all of the rest of that stuff in there. And then I would choose inline. And I could set my pixel width. Now, if I want it in the middle of the text, I probably need less than 800 pixels. So let's see if that works from here. And I can insert this. And you'll see that it is directly within that text. And then I could even start typing after that if I wanted it to be within there. So your inline option allows it to stay even within the actual line of the text or directly underneath. And it's the figure option that would automatically bump it to a new line and maybe even a new page to kind of adjust your text as much as possible in there. Um, the other part there, so you, can, you notice, I go into this one and I edit. There is no ID because it's an um, inline image. It's really our figure images that have IDs and that will be auto generated. So you don't have to worry about that at all. Um, but right here you see this ID part. So there's an ID piece here. Um, and that actually has to do with our bookmarking. So I could say figure below. And if I wanted to hyperlink this to a figure, in addition to you, a URL, I could actually anchor it to a specific thing. So I could anchor it to one of these figures and that's kind of where your objects come in. I wanna say this is figure number two. Um, and then if a student clicked on that, it would jump them to that figure. So you could actually reference figures in other places on there. Um, but that ID, generally when you put a new one in, so let's see if we can do that from here. Image options, I'm gonna make this a figure, save it. And then if I go back, it auto-generated that ID for that image for you, just so that if I ever wanted to reference it, it would be um, able to reference it within the text itself. So that's not something that you wanna create, that's something that will auto-generate if you create a figure image that you might wanna reference from elsewhere within the text itself. So I think with that, since we're talking about kind of embedding different pieces, let's show you embedding videos. And this is the one where right now you can see I'm in regular text, I can embed a video. If I'm in an image, I can't touch the videos. Um, sometimes in a bulleted list, the videos will be grayed out. Headers, videos are grayed out. So just make sure that you're adding videos in plain regular text and that will give you all of those options. Um, so you can see a video here. Let's go to a new topic just so you see kind of another way to find stuff. So I can keep this as a draft, which I'm gonna do because I was putting a bunch of random text in there and I don't want my updates to be pushed out to my students. If I, however, finalized it, that would not be a problem um, because I would still be able to go back and edit it after. It just means anyone with access to that book would be able to see those updates. Um, so another option in here, let's say we had animals. Um, I know there's a topic in here about animals. So let's say importance of mammals. Let's go ahead and edit that one. And here you'll see some options kind of at the bottom, just like there was in the last one for a video. So let's say you were working down here and you accidentally deleted this video and it didn't already have the nice little YouTube link there, but even if it does, I can copy this link or I could pull any YouTube video from elsewhere. I could go to YouTube and here is my lovely human planet piece. And if I wanted to share that video, I could simply copy the URL and I could add this back in. And if I simply right click on this and paste this URL in, oh, it doesn't option, so Control V, Command V, we'll put that in there. And it actually embedded that video. And you can't see the video right here in edit mode, but if you click on that multimedia icon and then the edit media option up here, you can actually preview that video. And so I can say, oh yep, that's the video I wanted. I'm good to go from there. So option number one 
is to just paste the URL for that. I could alternatively pull the embed code for that. So if I go back to that YouTube page, and when I click share, there's an embed option on YouTube. And this gives me an embed code. And the cool thing about embed codes is you can sometimes add, I love this video, but I want it to start at a certain time. So if I made that start at, let's say time, you know, 20 seconds in, it would add that start time into the embed code for me. I could copy it. And then I go back and here, I would actually want to use my insert edit media and then see where it says embed code at the top. I would just paste that in there and I could preview that and it would show me that, yep, you have the correct piece. So that's a great way to include media from other places. Um, we had a bunch of questions when I did this before on how can I upload a video to CK12? What are the rights for that? How does that work? We don't host videos on CK12. You would be uploading that to YouTube or something like that and sharing the link to that. Um, so just know that piece that you can actually upload videos onto our site. Just like this particular video embedding option, let's say I wanted them to do practice. So review, say also try this practice and I wanted to embed the matching practice. Now, if I was browsing this particular section, I could probably see some details and it would show me some of those other resources down there. But from here, I'm just gonna go over the details tab and say, this topic is from what concept? And in this case, it's not showing a concept node right there, but maybe we wanna say, okay, let's edit this. It was on what, the importance of mammals. So I'm gonna open up a different tab for a second. CK12, the importance, mammals, and I can see that concept there. So here's a read, here's an assessment, here's the whole concept. And this pulls up all of the resources for there. We have the text that we had, the video that we were working off of, and here's the practice. So if you're accessing practice from a concept page like this and you open it up, you can pull the embed code for practice from these three like nice little ellipses down here. It would allow you to download that PDF of the practice and then the embed. And just like I did on YouTube, I would copy this embed code, Command C. I go back here to the read that I was editing and I would say, okay, I'm gonna embed this media, paste that in there and I can preview it. And it will show me that it's giving me that practice for the importance of being mammal. Um, so that's an option here. I'm just gonna go back to this read for a second. So if I'm going back, oops, to all of the modalities for here, if you're accessing the read, not in edit mode, um, but you should be able to see that it's tagged to a particular concept under the details. And you can see some different options as you work your way through it. See here it says concept nodes, the importance of mammals, both in biology and life science. And so that would give you kind of the, if it, the title wasn't enough, you could search for the concept that is attached to that. Um, and that would help you get to that page as you work your way through. The last kind of thing that you could do, just for fun, we could say, and check out these CK12 dogs. So one thing we discovered in talking to teachers was that you can actually embed other things that have embed codes on CK12. So for example, we have this great CK12 slide presentation about some dogs that are in our office. Um, and here, if you wanted to embed your slides, I could click File, and then Publish to the Web, and I'd pull the embed code from there. And I could copy that, go back here, click on my media, and by now you guys all hopefully have seen the media embed code option and preview piece here. And I can insert that. Now, a couple of notes, just to remember, you're sharing this content with anyone who has a link to your book, whether or not you've published that book. So if you've created internal slide presentations for your class that have copyrighted material in there, this would not be a place that you'd wanna link it from there because you would wanna make sure that you can access that content from there. Um, but hopefully that gives you an idea of how to embed a couple different types of media within your presentation. 
Thanks, Katie. Um, now's a good time to stop and check in on some really interesting questions that people are coming up with. The first one is he'd like to know the benefits and the differences between creating an MS Word file and then like maybe making a PDF of it and sharing it through the cloud, like a Google Drive, and a CK12 Flexbook. Like what are the advantages of not just using Word and using a Flexbook? Sure, so I think there's a couple different advantages that I can think of right off the bat. Um, one is that this is integrated cleanly with all of our other modality types. So if I look over to that page right here, I'm gonna just click back to all modalities. So this is the importance of mammals. This is the text page that you'd be working off of um, that I was editing, but it's also linked to the video, it's linked to the practice. We have a real world application. Some of our um, physics and chemistry concepts have simulations, a good portion of our math and science concepts have clicks interactives so you'll see all of these other related resources that work from there um, so that's kind of one thing to think about is that it's easy access to link it to other modality types for learning as opposed to having a standalone word doc and then having to keep linking out like these some of these can be embedded they're cleanly tied within here i could assign all four of these modalities to my students within ck12 um, or I could assign them within a matching learning management system such as Google Classroom or Canvas or Schoology. Um, so there's a lot of options for kind of additional learning besides a Word document as well as um, kind of that coordinated components and assignments within this piece. Um, also kind of if you're thinking about it as the structure, I'm going to save this for a second and go back into the structure have the same as a draft and this is my whole flexbook and so this really helps me kind of group and orient all the pieces within here i can expand this introduction to life science and there are 10 sections within there i could edit any one of these sections i could reorder them very easily i could delete them if i don't want to cover something on a microscope and if 30 seconds later i realized i actually wanted that one i could go back to the original ck12 book and add that particular concept to this book um, so all sorts of options for kind of going from there. I think we had a question about adding chapters. So if I wanted to add new chapters, I could click on adding content and then I could add a new chapter. And this would be a, you know, all the things I forgot to cover kind of at the very end of my book, maybe. Anytime you add content to CK12, it generally shows up at the bottom of what you're working with. So here, I'm gonna see the all the things I forget to cover. And that makes sense at the end of this book, but maybe it's the things that I forgot to cover last year. And so maybe I want this to be the first chapter within, if I can continue to hold that while I drag up and try to adjust. Um, and we can put that there. So all the things I forget to cover last year, that's maybe my introduction. And then I can open this and I can say, let's put this one in here. And now if I wanna move stuff from one chapter to another, just make sure both chapters are open and I can kind of drag in between pieces as we go. So Katie, right on that topic, we have a question here about when a person tries to add a new lesson or section, it makes it a whole new chapter. And then how does she get it into the right place? So we saw you do that with a chapter, but can you show us? Yeah, and actually what I'm gonna say is that when you're adding content, you wanna make sure you're not in edit mode. So right now, if you look at this URL at the top, it says revision three at the end of it. So I'm currently editing. So if I'm gonna start adding stuff from CK12 into this book, um, and I'm not doing it through this option where I'm searching for content and adding it directly. So I could do this here. I could say mammals, I wanna add something from here. I could pull up, I want, full textbooks or mammal overview. Let's say this one. I'm gonna add this to my book. It's a section. I will find this at the bottom. If it shows up as a quote unquote chapter, it's actually not a chapter unless it has that little green expand option. So I can just drag it into a chapter by doing that and then opening up an actual chapter and pulling it in. It's really just saying it doesn't fit in a chapter right now, so it's at that higher level piece until I pull it into a chapter. But I'm going to save this for a second because this is super important. If I'm editing, editing from elsewhere, so let's say that book is saved, it's, I'm not in edit mode, that's when I could go to another page. So I could go like to this particular read. And here I could add this to a Flexbook textbook. And it would allow me to add it to that particular book here. 
Um, and actually, I think this read is in there already. So let me pick something totally random. Let's say uh, triangles, because I know that's not going to be kind of in there. Um, and it won't try to figure out what to do with the same read in there twice. But if I picked a totally different topic, I could add this to my Flexbook textbook. I'm going to add it to the bottom of my life science concept, because you know who in life science wouldn't want to learn about triangles? And then when I go back to my life science thing, you'll see it's not in there yet because I haven't refreshed this page. So I would want to access this cleanly from my library. I can now open this book up and it will pull all those updates, that clean updates. And at the very bottom, you'll see the section on triangles. And right now it looks like a chapter because there's no chapter structure. If I edit this, It'll open up and you'll see that I can drag that particular section. It doesn't have that chapter piece in there. I can open up any chapter and drag it within there. All right, Katie, the next couple of questions are about creating a flexbook with others. And, you know, is there a way on CK12 to have a committee work on creating a flexbook module so they can put it together? And does it have to be all one account? So just like I made sure I closed and saved this book before I went to a different tab and edited, you can only ever have, I would say, not even just one person, but one tab open in edit mode at any point in time. That's kind of your best practice so that you don't end up doing work, switching to a new tab, doing work over there, saving that and realizing you saved over changes you made in a different tab. Um, so you should have a clean workflow for anything that you're doing. Um, if you're looking to create a book kind of from the get-go, what I might do is have everyone work on a chapter in their own accounts, and then one person create a book structure and add those individual chapters to that book, and then you can make updates there. Once everything fits within one book, and that's kind of the, the main course of the book that you're working with, then only the people, like only the account owner should make updates. Because every time you open it and you customize it, you're creating a second copy of that book. You're not editing. Some ways to get around that that schools have used for right now are that they create kind of like a science at, you know, Middletown High School or something like that, like a, a book like that, that, sorry, an account like that where all of the books live and then the correct person can log into that account and make updates at any point in time. But you still want to make those, for any particular book in your system, only one person should be editing that book in one tab at any point in time. Okay, well, I think let's move on, but keep your questions posting in the Q&A window. We will address all the questions there before we leave you. Um, but I want to show you two short videos of teachers customizing Flexbooks to best meet the needs of their students. The first clip is of a social studies teacher, Jonathan Wood, from Tullahoma, Tennessee. And the second is Jessica Favela Casillas, who's a chemistry teacher in El Paso, Texas. And I'm going to go ahead and take the screen back and we will go watch those videos all right my favorite thing about it is is you can update change um content um adapt to what you need for that classroom um if i have some content on there that that i think is is not working or the students don't like or um that i don't like that it's just it, for whatever reason i it's not working the way I thought it would. I can find other stuff and, and use other stuff to, to change those chapters and, and change the format of everything. I'll, I can also upload videos anytime I want to there, upload uh, any pictures that I need on there, any other resources, you know, as needed. So that, that's what I like the most, but I can kind of form it the way I, I, I want to. We were asked to reorganize um, the flexbook that was already there and adapt it completely to EPISD and our curriculum, our scope and sequence. We added things that were student friendly, we added videos and uh, I think that was a really good experience because as a, as a chemistry teacher I knew what my kids were, were needing as far as, as a textbook, as far as content went and I could rely on the textbook to have videos and interactives and any kind of visual that I thought they needed um, that they couldn't get in, in a standard textbook.
Okay, with that, let's move into CK12's options for including special characters and math formatting. So whether you're a science or a math teacher, or you simply want to add extra formatting for special characters, our special characters menu and our math editor will allow you to do that. So the special characters menu, I'll show you in a second. But this math editor, I just wanted you to see it cleanly right off the bat so you can see that drop down feature. Um, up in the right, there's the how to use the math editor button if you're stuck for any reason. Um, but we have kind of two different workflows based on your level of knowledge of math coding um, and law tech. And so based on that, we'll kind of talk through both pieces. So I think with that, I'm gonna steal this screen back from Carl. I'm gonna close out of this piece and we're gonna just start fresh from CK12. So let's go to CK12 cleanly. And we did some browsing to books and pieces like that. Um, but let's pick a new topic. Let's say one on genetics and the Hardy-Weinberg model. So if I open this up, I could edit a read directly. So if I wanted to edit a piece right here, I could go in, and this might just be a standalone read. If I'm editing a book, I recommend that you do the whole book. If you're just doing kind of a lesson for something, then this is another way that you could go about doing that. And once I click customize, I can update the title or leave it as is, and we get into our tool. So from here, if I just needed something like a degree symbol, this little special character menu option allows me to pull up those pieces. I could add pi in there if I needed pi. I could add a square root piece. So you have some options with your standard special character menu that you'd see anywhere else. But today I want to talk about our math editor a little more because that's where there are some different pieces. So here we're talking about the Hardy-Weinberg model. And let's say I wanted to put in that formula. So the math editor is the X and the little curly braces. So if I click on that, it pops up my math editor. Now because I haven't done anything in here, I have the ability to use all of our drop down menu options. So I could say, okay, I'm gonna click in this piece. This is where I want it to start showing up. I want a function. I want that to equal something. And I want it to equal something raised to a power. So I'm gonna use this option. And I could put that in as P squared. Now, say for example, I actually want this to be based on BB. So if I wanna change something in the code, the minute you start changing the code, it, it works in one direction. The dropdown works one way, but the code doesn't populate the dropdown. So once you start changing the code, you kind of lose pieces of that. You can fudge it a bit by saying, okay, I'm gonna type directly in here, and maybe I need another fraction. And if you know how that code works, you can get the, out, the framing of that code and add it in there. Um, but just know that if I preview this, notice that it's missing that last piece because I haven't filled anything in. So feel free to explore this dropdown option. Um, you know, we have fractions, radicals. If I click on any of these, it gives me my options here. You can start seeing different pieces. We discovered the other day that we needed a couple science ones added into here that weren't currently in here, so we're working on pieces like that. So let us know if there's something that you think is pretty common that should be added to here. Um, or you can always look up the LaTeX code for something and make it extra special formatting. But I'm gonna delete that. Here's my function. I'm gonna preview it and see what it looks like now. And there are three choices for math formatting. Inline, just like an inline picture, will show up directly in the line of the text that you're working with. A line at would bump to a new line, and block math will bump to a new line and center it. So based on what you're looking for, those are different options as you work your way through. Um, so just know that those are your pieces that you can do. If you know all sorts of fun LaTeX coding, by all means, feel free to use it. Um, but do know that some of the, um, like especially if you're using colors or something like that, um, some of those extra special colors may or may not translate in our PDF translator if you're trying to print pieces as well. So um, feel free to use our dropdown. Feel free to use LaTeX coding pieces as you work your way there. Um, but definitely based on your skill level and what you're working with, those are options. I can add that in. Note that if there's already an equation here and I double click on it to open that math editor or I click on it and then open the editor, it doesn't even give me the drop down piece because the code's already in there and it's not going to work backwards. Um, so if I did want to start from that drop down feature, I would at this point need to start from scratch with a new equation as I work my way through. 
So hopefully that gives you a little idea of that. Um, I'm just going to check in on questions for a second before we continue on with other formatting. Sure, we have a question here, which is, could we copy and paste an equation, for example, from the web to be converted automatically into the math editor? At this point in time, I haven't seen anyone do that. Um, you, if you know kind of pieces here, so like if I kind of open up a new one and I say math editor, um, and then I wanted to like write something simple, like y equals 2x plus 5, that, that's kind of standard. It doesn't have a lot of extra formatting in LaTeX, so I could do something like that. Um, if you wanted to copy a, the code, the LaTeX code from the website, um, we've definitely done that. I've done that before where I've needed something super specific for formatting that wasn't included in our dropdown, and I copied the LaTeX coding, and I pasted the code right here, and then I included that that way. So not kind of like a pre-formatted equation. Unfortunately, math formatting seems to be pretty um, like program and platform specific. Like even I remember converting between like Word and Open Office and Google Docs and all of those had like slightly different formatting backends and pieces and nothing ever looked the same. Um, so that's currently the same for our system. Um, you, you would need to start from a clean formatting piece or pulling code from a website if you wanted to pull the code, um, making sure that you're not pulling code from previously copyrighted material as you go. Katie, I have a really interesting question here. For you, Katie Hammond, I have a question from Katie Hammond. So it's very close. I thought it was you, but it's not. If you're using a Flexbook that your district has created and you edit it, are you editing the dis district's textbook or yours? So if you are the owner of the account, you can edit the book that you have there. Notice when I went into this book, for example, I'm gonna save this for a second. This is the book I'm editing. And my option right here is to actually edit this book because this book lives in my library. It's my copy of the book. It's the one I'm working with. If I shared this link with my colleague Carl and he wanted to edit it, he would see a customized option there, just like I saw when I started from a CA12 book. So if you're editing a book um, and it, it wasn't yours to begin with, you would first have to customize it and then you'd be editing your copy of it. You wouldn't be editing the district book. Only where the owner of that book has the ability to edit that particular book. So you'd have to log into that account to make edits on a district level book. All right. Well, with that, let's move into some last options to enhance your Flexbook and adding clarity. Great. So we did some math formatting. I'm going to close that out because I don't want that mixed in here. Um, we have all sorts of options on our formatting piece. You have your standard bold, italics, underline, strike through sub and superscripts. We have a subset of colors that do work with our printing options. So if you're going to pick colors, I would recommend using those for your text or for your highlighting pieces. And then we have some format options. So right now, the standard text, if I click on this, it shows you that it's our standard paragraph option. This particular one looks like it's a section one header. Um, what that does, if I save this, um, I'll save it at the end, you'll be able to see kind of like a faint horizontal line break for any new section just to help students kind of break up that text visually on a web page versus actually having a page to turn within a textbook. Um, so you have some options here. Item and description I'll talk about in a second. Um, but you have a few section header options and your paragraph options and then your coloring options for text. Um, at the very bottom, you can see kind of different choices between numbers and bullets. Those are all here. Add, add, bullet list, number list. Um, if you right click on any of these sections here, you can actually edit the start of your list. So if you, let's say I wanted these questions to all be in line and I wanted to reference this as a new question, I could start this list at five and then it would say these are one through four and that's five through eight. So that might help you kind of break up which questions you're referencing if there's more than one section. We also have the ability to decrease or increase the indent. So I can decrease that, mess that up, go back from there. I can say, oop, that should be a number, so let's undo those changes <laughs> a little bit and step backwards. So you have options. If you find this screen to be too small to work with, our full screen option allows you to expand this and you can work full screen for editing or jump back down to the editor within the larger platform. And then there's a couple other kind of cool pieces. We've talked about um, media, images, special characters, math editors. Um, so anything that's grayed out that's not letting you do stuff, it's probably because you're in a header mode. So just make sure you're out of those pieces. 
Um, you could add a page break. Page breaks are not really very useful on a web where there's not a page, but a page break, when you, if you were printing a customized book, that would create a clean break and start anything past that on another page. So if you included an answer key or something and you wanted that on a separate page, you could use that. The table option, you could create a table. We have some choices for tables, but it is limited based on the ability to convert to PDF and work your way through. So use those features as you want. I'm gonna add a little table in here. Um, we were talking about different pieces, um, kind of for DNA and modeling and genetics. So maybe we had some sort of choices here. And, oops, B and B. This is little B, big B, little B, something like that. And then you could start kind of doing your table accordingly. If you right click, you have some options for table properties. You could put a border around pieces. I can make that table in line with other options. I could add a table caption, um, genetic summary. So that kind of just gives me the summary of what that is in general. But the actual caption is the piece that put like, um, genetics, offspring. So you could create some pieces. So you have some options for tables as you work your way through. The other thing that I love is what we call our element box. So I'm gonna bump out of here and I'm gonna insert an element box. Um, and being a former math teacher, I'd say every math book I ever saw had these light blue boxes with formulas. Um, so if I wanted to make sure that I included this formula again, I could put in all those pieces, I could include a math editor, I could continue my working my way through my formula, and in this case, I could put these pieces in here, and then because I know, let's see, we have two PQ, this one's pretty straightforward, that one is all set, I can insert that, and I can see the pieces in there. So all sorts of options for that. I can even visually break, if I want kind of something, even if it's not a new header, I could put my own horizontal line to help visually break as we're working our way through. And then a couple other funky ones, we have kind of block quote if you wanna quote offset piece. We have definitions, so let's say I wanted some definitions in here. I could insert a term in definition. So let's say we had an allele and then the variant of a gene. If I went back down again, I could go back and get another definition kind of use the increase, decrease indent to work my way through, wheels, et cetera. Or I could simply say, I'm gonna add a whole new definition piece in there and it'll put those pieces in. So if you're interested in kind of putting all this extra formatting, I definitely recommend that you play around with some of those features in here. I do wanna talk about two more pieces within this part, just to add clarity to your book. One is the resources tab. So here I could upload files, an answer key, a worksheet, making sure that I'm not uploading copyrighted material, um, but you could add those pieces there. You will see our kind of chapter pieces, answer keys often at the chapter level or the book level uploaded as resources. Um, if you do switch things around, you would need to kind of re-upload files so they match correctly as you work your way through, but know that that is an option. And then the details tab is super, super important. You could put descriptions, Learning objectives, you can include vocabulary that would be a reference in the vocab section and would show up at the end of a section if you were printing a PDF. And then all of these great attributions. So if you're pulling material that you're allowed to pull but that you need to attribute accordingly, then you'd wanna add some attributions. You could change the grade level, the concepts that it's tagged to, et cetera, as you work your way through. So all sorts of options but make sure that you're using those details as you work your way through to keep things clean and clarified. Those same details tab, if I was in my book, I'm just gonna bump back to that life science book for a second. See our resources here for the book level, it has all your answer keys. Details options, it has all those pieces. And you can edit those resources and details at the book, the chapter, and the section level when you're in edit mode from here. So hopefully that gives you some information. I'll just pull that up so you can kind of see what that looks like um, in edit mode. But gives you some information both to add content within pieces. So here's all my sections, but I can edit the chapter level by just pulling up that edit option here. I can edit the resources and details for the book level from the table of contents. So let's see how we're doing on questions for a few minutes and go from there. 
Sure. Um, one of the things that somebody had a question on was w you mentioned there will be some more options added for science in the math editor. Can they access any like anything right now or do we have to wait? So if you're talking about kind of for the math editor pieces, if we're adding, if we're looking into adding science options, you can anything that you're in here. So if I'm in this one, let me go back to edit draft. Um, if we don't have something in that math editor right now for you, then you would want to use that LaTeX coding shortcut. And you can look up online, like what's the LaTeX coding for whatever, um, and kind of use that formatting. There's, that's a conversation that came up last week when we had a couple of science teachers request new things that hadn't been asked for before. Um, and that will take some time to go from there. Um, I know some people have had questions about like arrows and getting from one thing to another. So you could look up long right arrow and then kind of open pieces, the close it and you'd see this. You'd see, okay, I want that long right arrow to go to this part right here. So you could, you could look up some of that coding yourself um, and include that. If there's something that you think we're missing that you want us to develop and add in, please let us know. But that will take some time to kind of update that back end and include it. Great. And um, how about, how can the reading material be differentiated for students who need a more simplified text? Sure. So we have a couple of options for different resources. So sometimes you'll see, if I go back to CK12, um, let's pick up like science branch. So like biology has in our flex book options, we have our original book, we have an advanced book, we have our standard bio concepts book. Um, in math, I think we have some, um, even some basic books. So for algebra, which is a core topic, um, you'll see kind of all of these explorations, basic algebra, we have high school options. So we have some of that that you could kind of pick and choose from as you work. Um, as you're editing, I know a lot of teachers that have used our content and made changes and created a couple different versions of their books or simply rewrote sections to make it more um, readable for students who struggle with language and reading. Um, so the, the ability to customize and tailor it to your class and your environment um, is super, super helpful. If you are in a book and you're having students that struggle with language, this select language option um, allows you to kind of convert that page into another language as a resource for students. Um, but know that you're converting the whole page. And if you're editing in there and some of it's in English and some of it's in other languages, it gets a little confused about which language any particular piece is. So try to stick with one whole language at any point in time. The next question is simply, can I embed community contributions into my own Flex yeah, so if you're talking about like the community contributed tab on our pages, so let's say I pick a topic, um, let's say probability, for example, and let's see what we have for fundamental counting principle. And there's some community content here. There's a read, study aid, web link, and real world applications. Um, anything that's a read that's one of our text modalities is specifically defined as a read, I can actually add it to my Flexbook as a whole section. So you don't need to embed that content. You can just add it as a section within your Flexbook. Um, know that you're kind of pulling, once you start pulling in there, you're pulling from content that you're gonna wanna double check to make sure it's all accurate um, because we vet and continue to update our content, but there are thousands and thousands and thousands, like 193,000 variations of our books. So we don't continually update to make sure all of their math is accurate. Um, that is on you if you choose to use the stuff in that space. All right, Katie, so let's um, go back to the presentation and talk about publishing. Sorry about that, we've got the wrong one. New share, keynote, there she is. Thanks, Carl. So I just want to take a minute to kind of talk about publishing. I know some questions have come in. Um, how do you publish? Why would you publish? What happens? Um, so on that left nav bar on any of your books or sections, right under resources is the option to publish. So in order to do that, you click that once 
any finalized updates would continue to get pushed through to a publication. That's not, once you publish, you're kind of good from there. Um, in general, you can, you know, save as draft anything you don't want to get pushed out immediately. Um, but I would say there's a couple good reasons for publishing. One is you can easily access your book, um, meaning your book is now searchable on CK12 as opposed to kind of having to always share a URL link or directly assign sections. Um, and then if you think about, you know, we just got asked, can I add content from that community contributed tab to my book? Great. The more people are adding content to there, the more resources other teachers have to work off of, especially for some of those non-STEM areas um, that might want to pull resources from a school that's created social studies content or English content or something like that. Um, so as I said, when you publish, your book becomes accessible via search. And then that schools icon on the homepage, you have to publish your book in order for it to show up on that school page for it to be findable. Um, and so if you wanna add a schools page from there, then you wanna make sure that if you don't have one, you email support to claim, kind of get that created. And then you can add a whole bunch of books for your school to that, whoever that point person for the school or district is. Um, so I would highly encourage you to publish your content um, you're not allowed to put anything on our site, regardless of whether or not you publish it that's not, doesn't fit under a copyright, so that shouldn't be something that's keeping you from publishing. Um, I would say, you know, if you're starting from scratch and there's no content in your book, maybe you want to wait to publish it until you actually have some content in there. Um, but once it's live and published and updated, you're good to go, and I would encourage you to publish. So the other thing that I just want to point out kind of is that tools and apps page. We had some questions about that Flexbook online and offline access via our Flexbook app or, or our offline reader. There's some information on that tools and apps page about our other sim, um, apps, our Sims app and our practice app, um, as well as if you keep scrolling down on that particular page, you'll find information on our integrated learning management systems. So definitely check out that page as you go through. All right. Well, I just want to say thanks to all our participants for joining today. And we want to wrap up um, just as we hit our hour mark here. But we'll remember, we will stay on for um, any additional questions you'd like us to answer. Um, we shared at the beginning, but don't forget to check out the ses session resource page handout. We put the link in this research in the chat window earlier, but you can also access it and all the rest of them inside the CEP Google Class. If you're looking to complete the Certified Educator Program, you'll want to fill out the assignment for this session. It's available in Google Classroom, and we suggest you complete it within one week of this session so everything is fresh. A reminder that all assignments must be completed before the end of July. As we've noted before, we have one feedback form for this whole program, and we hope you'll be using um, following our webinars. We've gotten some really great feedback so far, both for what's going well and how we can make the experience better for you. And we will continue to incorporate suggestions in this summer and in future trainings. This isn't mandatory, but if you're interested in giving us feedback, this form is also available in the Google class under the feedback topic. Um, now that you know all about editing Flexbooks, we hope you to continue your learning by joining us for some upcoming sessions, including Common Core Math and CK12 Platform for non-STEM users tomorrow morning. Tomorrow at 11 o'clock Pacific time, we have our founder, Niru Kosla, and I are going to sit down and have a little conversation, and you can present questions and ask her anything. So please think about it. If you can, send us the questions today at jumpstart at ck12.org so that we can make sure that we can have a response for your really interesting questions. Another way to connect with us and educators near you or in your field is to join us on Friday for any of our live chats. Registration for those can also be found in the CEP class or via the email we sent last week and in the link in the chat window. If you haven't already done so, please join our Jumpstart for Educators Cafe and start getting involved in networking with your coworkers. We've had some great questions on how others might use CK12 resources in their classes, and we really encourage you to ask your colleagues in this program how they might be thinking of using CK12 or have already used it. You can also join the conversation by liking us on Facebook at CK12, uh, a CK12 Foundation and following us on Twitter, at CK12 Foundation, or using the hashtag 
CK12 certified. Thank you so much for joining us here. We will continue to stay on and answer all the current questions in the queue in a window, but you're always welcome to email us with any questions you have or um, any questions you might have down the road. Thanks, Carl. I think we have one minute left here and we've had a lot of questions about kind of the program as a whole. So I'm gonna steal this and talk about Google Classroom for that last minute and then we'll go into the specific questions within here. So if you haven't joined our Google Classroom at all, you go to classroom.google.com, you click this plus sign, and then you click join class using the code we gave you. Um, and we can check your email, we can pull that up again, um, but you would access that code accordingly. Once you've added that code, you would click join, and it should bump you into our certified educator program. So from here, this particular topic is advanced flexbook editing. I highly recommend that you use the topics navigation on the left, because that will narrow all the pieces and I would click on Advanced Flexbook Editing. The first post you'll see in there is the option to, is kind of the description. It gives you some resources. Here's your session resource page that we talked about that has kind of all of those tips that we talked about and includes our licensing. It includes kind of a little preview of those pieces. So that'll be super, super helpful for you. Um, I recommend that you check that out, especially as you're doing your assignment. Once you get to right after that, you'll see the assignment option. And you can open this assignment, and in here, there's a Google form. So if you click on this form from that homepage, that's totally fine. Um, but if you click on this form within here, it will open up a new tab. You will fill out all the pieces of the form and then click submit. We had someone who had like a computer glitch and it wasn't submitting um, or connection issue. If for any reason that happens, just copy your text or screenshot it and send it to us that way and we'll figure it out. But you should, if all else goes well, click submit, turn that in. And once you get the confirmation screen for that, you can go back to here and you can simply mark this as done. Because it's a form and you're not attaching something, you can just simply click mark as done. You don't have to attach anything, I'm all set. And now for my own personal reference, when I go back here and I check this piece, it says, oh, we're gonna go back to the advanced flexbook editing part. It says I've completed this assignment. So I remember that I've actually turned that one in and I don't need to do it again. Below that, you'll see right now there's the link to join the webinar we're currently in. That will be changed by tomorrow, and you'll see both the recording from last week as well as the recording from today posted down here. Um, so I, I recommend that when you hit Google Classroom and you're in the stream and you're not sure where anything is, that you pick the session you're working with using the topic navigation. You can see our feedback form here. We talked about some live chats and your piece. All those registration links are here. This live chat link is here with Nero, and then we did a preview of Flexbooks 2.0 yesterday, and that recording is available there. So hopefully that helps with kind of navigating the Google Classroom environment. Um, and with that, I'm gonna go back to CK12 and talk about CK12. Can students with disabilities like dyslexia download the reads in PDF form so they can have a read aloud reader? So if you have created or customized content on our site, you'll have the option to kind of access a PDF of that. Um, we don't personally put our full books as PDFs because we um, encourage you to use our offline reader. That allows you to kind of continually sync up updates for stuff. We find that a lot of schools that download a PDF, they, you know, five years later, they're still using the same PDF from five years ago. And, you know, they haven't seen any of the great other resources we have. Um, so just know that particular piece, but if you're accessing a one-off read um, and you're, you should be able to kind of see those pieces in your customized options, um, and if you're having difficulty working with students with disabilities and are needing more resources, please email us and we can give you some more ideas on how to address those pieces. Great. The next question is, is there a way to block the vocabulary portion of Flexbooks and tell my students do activities with them and then I can put them back in? So if you were going to customize a particular book, you could remove that vocabulary. Um, you could have kind of two copies of that if you wanted in your library, but we haven't had that request so far. So it's not, it's not something that um, for our books, if they're accessing, we have a lot of hover over vocab and that's kind of built into the system. There's not an option to turn it off. Next, can you review how to insert a practice quiz again, please? Sure. So, um, if you're talking about practice, you would access that from whatever page you were working on. 
If it's a quiz that you made, you could access that from your library. So I'm gonna kind of go to my library. I think I was working on quizzes this morning. So let's find, I'm gonna filter using our nice little filter options. And here's homework, which is actually what I, I call the quiz. But regardless, you'd be on this practice page, whether it's a quiz or a practice option. Um, so here I'm on a quiz piece. If I get, went to the same practice page from the home page, that three ellipses at the bottom expands. Here's a great place that you can download the PDF or a worksheet. If it's a quiz, it will download the whole quiz. If it's a practice, it will pull a subset of practice because some of the practice questions we have, you know, 200 something algebra questions for whatever topic. Um, but once I'm there, I click embed and I'll get the embed code and then I would embed that just like I would a video as you're working your way through. Can you show also again how to locate a book from the app? Okay, so there's a couple of things that kind of, I'm, I, I'm not on a phone or a tablet, I'm on a computer, so I'm not gonna be able to use the app, but let me show you some options for the offline reader that would be very similar. Um, so if I go to CK12, um, first of all, you have to understand that the offline reader is for Flexbooks. That means I can download chapters or whole books, but not individual reads. So if you're not seeing an option to open something in a reader, then it means that it's probably not attached to a book and you need to access something in a book. So if I open this and I open a book, here you'll see this offline reader option. And if you were accessing this on a browser, on a tablet or a smartphone, then you would see this offline reader or kind of the app option and it would just say open an app. But I can click this offline reader. I'm gonna open this in reader and I'd be able to do this. If I'm accessing the app offline, I can actually access, let's, We've made some updates on that offline reader since I last opened this. Um, but see, I could download this full book or I could download individual chapters if I was working from pieces um, as I work my way through. So let's go back to that whole piece. Um, I would have to delete the current version of the book and go from there to do that. Um, but, because I think I have that particular one in my offline reader. Once I've downloaded it there, I can access in my offline library any of the resources that I made. So in this case, I could download this book or all of these other pieces. Um, if you are looking for a customized book, you can't browse for customized books within the app or the offline reader, but if you opened it in a separate window, just like I did for this particular piece, and then clicked the offline reader piece, then I'd be able to see that. So similarly, if I clicked on my library and I wanted to look at my Flexbook textbook, this is the one I made today, I would open that in like Safari on my iPhone or something like that, and then I would choose the open an app option instead of the offline reader option, and that would allow you to access customized books in that reader. All right, well, one of our users is still having problems creating a new section in the existing chapter. Can you go over that again? Sure, so there are two ways to go about doing that. Option A is if I'm in edit mode, I could create, add a content, so I could search CK12 for a section, and that would add it to the bottom. I would, let's say, we talked about, we said mammals. I could pick a topic from in here, and I could add the evolution of mammals to my Flexbook textbook. That would show up at the bottom, and then I would need to open, let's say I want it in chapter 11. I would need to open chapter 11, and then I would drag it into the matching chapter. So if you're just pulling CK12 content from within the editor, you can simply search for it, add it there, and then pull it from the bottom to whatever particular section you were looking for there. The other option is to write a new modality. So I'm gonna, if I wanted to write something from scratch, I could click write a modality. It's gonna save my book. It's gonna bump me into our brand new kind of editor tool that we were working with. And this is a new modality or in this case, it's a read, so new read. And I'm gonna save that. And then I can say a demo for adding to a Flexbook. And I'm gonna keep this as a draft or finalize it as I work my way through. And when I do that, and it's saving it, it shows up at the bottom, just like I did before. Um, so those are two different ways to kind of add content from within the book. If I was adding externally, I would wanna make sure to save this first so that I'm not in edit mode on one tab. And then anywhere else that I am on CK12, I could go through 
I can pick a topic and I can actually add a whole book. I've had people say, well, what if I want to combine two books? I could add, this is the life science concepts for middle school. If I wanted to add a book or a chapter from the kind of original flex book that we had, I could go into a whole chapter and I could add that whole chapter to a flex book. And because this is a chapter, when I go back to my library and I open that book, I'm gonna go down to the bottom and you see it has this whole chapter and all the sections that brought everything with it when it came in. Um, but if I wanted to move that, I would go back into edit mode and readjust it accordingly, just like I did for any of the other pieces. Okay, I think we have another person asking about practice quizzes into a Flexbook. Um, I showed you a quiz a minute ago. I'm gonna show you kind of general practice. The same applies. If it's a quiz, you'd pull it from your library. If it's practice, you'd pull it from any of the practice pages. So if I pick a topic, fields in life science, I would open the matching practice. And on the left side here are your embed pieces. And I would just pull this embed code. So it's gonna load that embed code. I'm gonna copy it, Command C or Control C. And then when I'm in editing mode for any book or section, so let's go just to a section. So I'm gonna open that new read I just made. It's gonna be nice and clean with nothing in it. And I wanna edit something in here. And then I would use my embed media option. And that's when you would paste your practice option in there. You do the same thing for a quiz if it was a quiz instead of practice that you were embedding. And I can finalize this and show you what it looks like on the flip side instead of bumping back into the editor. And here you'll see that practice directly embedded in here. Please remember that if you embed practice or plicks or anything else within your text and you assign the read, you are not separately assigning that practice and you will not get a score report unless you assign the practice directly to your students. I think with that, we're out of questions for today. Thank you for joining us. Um, we hope to see you on a couple more webinars this week and throughout the school year as you work your way through. Have a good day.